Okay. Well, I'll take one copy. Okay, great. Okay. Well, thank you for that terrific introduction. It's uh, a, <clears throat> uh, it's really, it's it's a thrill to be here. Uh, as Peter said, this is the publication date. It's sort of the launch of this book into the world after this kind of two-year process of sitting with it. Um, so it's it's fitting that it would be in a place that is devoted sort of to the the lore and the life of people who I've been hanging out with for many years to come up with the stories that are in this book. Um, you know, and sp spies are interesting people. You know, they're sort of a very prickly lot sometimes. And um, they actually, have, one thing I've, I've learned in, in, in hanging out with uh, in people in the intelligence community, they don't necessarily always like to be called spies. They often prefer the term intelligence professional, which is sort of, I guess, you know, a sort of a euphemistic way of say, talking about what they do. I guess I'm just a, I'm a media professional. But uh, there's a character in the book, actually, Mike McConnell, who was the director of national intelligence from 2007 to 2009 and was sort of the chief intelligence professional, if you like, and worked for President Bush. And he uh, is asked, uh, at one point, someone asks him, they say, well, how do you define a spy? What does a spy do? Or intelligence professional, if you like. And he says, well, let me put it to you this way. A diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell and make you look forward to the trip. A spy is someone who can tell you to go to hell and has the means to deliver you there. <laughs> Um, I suppose I probably shouldn't cast, uh, cast stones. I'm reminded of a quote that someone had about people once in my business. A man turns to a friend and says, yes, I'm a journalist. I write for the newspaper. But please don't tell my mother. She thinks that I play piano in a brothel. <laughs> um, for the past two years as I've been putting together this book and really kind of shaping the narrative that comes out into the story of the Watchers, um, people would always ask me, say, well, what is the book about? Sort of give us the nutshell of it. And I'd say, well, First and foremost, this book is a story. The Watchers are five men who have spent much of their career in the intelligence agencies working for the government, and they are united by a common idea. And this idea is that with the right access to information and to the right information, we can divine the signs of future crises and terrorist attacks before they happen. The Watchers have spent 25 years building technological systems capable of ingesting huge amounts of information and filtering through it looking for the signals and the warning signs of disaster. They are guardians and spies. They are technicians and officials. They watch us at the same time that they watch over us. And collectively, these five people have been responsible for building, running, and in some cases, even tearing down a formidable system of glo global surveillance capability that allows the government to effectively monitor whoever it wants, whenever it wants, wherever it wants. And people would say, well, that sounds very interesting. And invariably, one out of three of them would always say, so this is fiction that you're writing about. And I would kind of stop and say, no, 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 I don't know what gave you that impression. This isn't, this isn't fiction. This is nonfiction. This is journalism. Oh, well, so you, you must have changed the names of the people who were involved in this kind of thing. And, you know, no, this is, you know, the people that you see in the book are real people. They exist. Many of them, most of them are alive today. And the things that they didn't say uh, in the book are precisely what they didn't say. And, you know, I sort of thought about what is this that made some people sort of react to this as if this were some sort of fanciful story. And I thought, well, there may be two explanations. One is that perhaps the sketch I've just given you is, in fact, so fantastic that it sounds like it must be an episode of 24 or some sort of a Jerry Bruckheimer movie, in which case, you know, if that were true, perhaps I should have skipped the book and just gone to Hollywood with the idea. And the second was, you know, I thought, well, maybe it's just that I've sketched out this idea of a system that is so sophisticated and so coordinated in its reach that no reasonable person could possibly believe the United States government was responsible for it. Maybe a little bit of column A, maybe a little bit of column B, a little healthy skepticism. But what this reminded me in talking to people about this book as it was taking shape is that people often have a, a great deal of skepticism and uncertainty about what they read of the intelligence community and what's really going on in this world. And as a journalist or an historian writing about the intelligence domain, this is one of the toughest targets there is. And you're talking about an area in which people are actively trying to keep information from you. I mean, this museum is very much devoted to a trade craft that is built on keeping secrets and on deceiving people in many cases. So as somebody who is looking for truth and facts in that terrain, it can be quite challenging. To put this in some sort of perspective, imagine that you are a theater critic. This is what it's like being an intelligence reporter. You're a theater critic, and your editor has assigned you to go open, to cover the opening of a new play. And you walk into the theater, and you take your seat, and the lights go down, and the play begins, but the curtain never goes up. You hear footsteps behind the curtain. You hear people moving around. You catch snatches of muffled dialogue. 
Occasionally you hear somebody bumping into a set, you hear something rattling around, you see light moving underneath the curtain. Occasionally someone bumps the curtain and you get a little peek. Sometimes somebody comes out from behind the curtain and leans over on the apron and whispers to you and says, I'm not supposed to tell you what's going on behind the curtain, but listen. Then somebody comes out, usually in a suit, and says, I know somebody just came out and told you what they thought was going on behind the curtain. That's not what's going on at all. We're not going to talk about what's going on behind the curtain. And this is kind of the world we live in, in which we are, as reporters, constantly grabbing these fragments of a story where we can, and then going back and taking a step back and trying to fashion them into a mosaic and a narrative. And there's a funny story that, that happened to me personally that kind of illustrates this. In 2005 and in early 2006, I was doing a lot of reporting on the National Security Agency's program of warrantless uh, surveillance of phone calls and emails, which takes up a big chunk of the book and I'll talk about in a little bit as well. And I had been getting information from sources of mine in the telecom industry who know one little thread of this, and people who were out of government who had been hearing things, and a few people who were in the agencies who knew some information and kind of weaving it together. And I actually went to some sources on the intelligence committees on the Hill and asked them for comment about this. And I sort of lay out the story as I understand it and say, well, what can you tell me about this? I mean, what's your reaction to that? And at one point, one of the staffers actually stopped me and said, you should just stop asking me questions right now because clearly you know more about this story than we do which I suppose says something about the intelligence oversight process that's not too encouraging. But this kind of thing happens on this beat. Is it frequently the case that as the chroniclers, the people, journalists and historians who are going around picking up these pieces, we often see a totality of a narrative that even the people in the play behind the curtain don't always see. So that's one way of doing this. The second way of telling a story and building up uh, a narrative in this beat is to form relationships with people and often very deep personal relationships that are built on trust and built on kind of a mutual understanding of reporter and source. And while I think that The Watchers really was born out of both of these kinds of methods of writing and reporting, it's the latter, the personal relationships that are, if you like, the heart and soul of what this book is about, because it is ultimately a story about people, people who've built these systems and why they did it and what they hope to achieve and what that means for all of us. And for me, personally, and for this book, the relationships really began with one individual in particular. Uh, in November of 2002, I was working as a technology reporter for Government Executive Magazine, which, as Peter said, is sort of a, a premier publication covering the, the senior executive service. It's like Business Week and Forbes crossed together, but about government, business for feds. And writing about technology in November 2002, about a year after the 9-11 attacks, there was some one sort of meta theme that everybody was covering, connecting the dots. The narrative that had developed after 9-11 was that the government had failed to connect the dots about al-Qaeda and the events preceding the attacks in New York and Washington. The FBI had information on some of the terrorists, the CIA was collecting intelligence, the NSA had their share of it, but nobody had fused these different streams, these dots together and formed a cohesive picture. And at that point, technology, it seemed, was an answer to this problem, a remedy, a way of actually going into these databases and systems that collect all these dots and actually making some sense and connecting them. And I don't think a week went by, even a year after 9-11, that I wasn't pitched by a company, a government agency, or a would-be entrepreneur that had some sort of grand idea for how they were going to fix this problem. We've built the computer system, the software program, the algorithm that can take care of it. And it really almost took on almost a ghoulish kind of aspect with literally kind of people rolling through with big publicity campaigns of we can stop the next 9-11 if you only let us. And of course this was post dot com collapse on the west coast and lots of companies were looking to come to Washington and cash in on a homeland security market that was growing. So in the midst of all of this, these incessant pitches, I get a call from the public affairs officer at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. <coughs> and for those of you who aren't familiar with DARPA, it is basically the Pentagon's futurist brain trust. DARPA is the place where government and academic scientists invented things like stealth technology. It's a place where several decades ago, a group of computer engineers connected their machines with a primitive network, which they called the ARPANET which you and I now know as the Internet. DARPA was the place where people in government and research went to solve big, hard technological problems. And in November 2002, what was the big technological problem? Connecting the dots. So no surprise, DARPA calls up and says, well, we're working on something in this area and we'd like to tell you about it. We started up a new office called the Information Awareness Office. And the Centerpiece program is something that we call Total Information Awareness. 
which I have to say, in terms of like the catchiness factor was pretty good. I mean, this is a pretty ambitious title, right? Total information awareness. There's information out there. We're going to become totally aware of it. We're going to solve the problem. So they sort of had, you know, this kind of, you know, this aspect to it as well, where you kind of think, all right, they're selling something. 